about transformer and also the large language model. So large language model is having a uh, lots of amazing applications recently. For example, uh, this is the PetGPT. We can ask PetGPT to make a syllabus for our course TinyML and efficient deep learning computing. And let's see what is the given. Uh, what does it produce? Um, efficient neural network architectures, quantization, pruning, actually exactly what we covered, the sequence exchange, uh, edge AI hardware, NPUs, frameworks, and tools, TF Lite, which actually makes a lot of sense. Actually, I can do a uh, translation between uh, different languages, and also uh, the GitHub Copilot can help write the code. And the recently pretty amazing part is uh, GPT-4 also uh, uh, included the, the vision language model. Okay? It can not only pro process the text, but, but also the vision inputs. For example, we ask it, how long is the edge? What is the angle here? And it's going to say the value is uh, here is 4, here is 8, uh, here is 8. Therefore, we can get a C is uh, 16 plus 64 and have square root of that. And also the uh, angle here will be a tangent theta equal to uh, 4 divided by 8. Therefore, we can calculate the theta here. Okay, very exciting. And here is a demo for the recent GPT-4 where you can feed it with a visual input picture and then ask it to lower the bike seat. And actually, you can do continuous interaction, not just one image, but continuous interaction with multiple images and do the conversation using the image as part of the input conversation. And also, feed it with a menu, it's pretty complicated text in the image. So it's going to do uh, recognize the text in the menu and match it with the toolbox. Okay, solve the problem. So let's see how is that um, how is that happening and what is the basics and foundations of such a uh, large language model? We're going to start with transformer basics, which is the building block of this amazing um, piece of work. And also design variants, what are the new uh, designs, followed by large language model, and also vision uh, language model with many advanced topics. So let's start with transformer basics. So there are uh, two categories of natural language processing tasks. One is generative task, uh, one is discriminative task. For example, given an input sentence as a visual treat, the film is almost perfect. And we want to classify um, the sentiment, for example, of this sentence is either positive or negative. The second category is generative task. Given um, the first couple of words in the sentence and predict the next word in the sentence. Before the transformer uh, era, people use recurrent neural nets and also LSTMs uh, to model the language. So it has an input layer, a hidden layer, and also the output layer. Uh, if we uh, enroll this RNN in time, so this T1, T2, T3, T4, yeah, each time step you have input, you have output, you have a hidden state. And here the current hidden state depends on not only the current input, but also the hidden, the previous hidden state. Okay, so it has a dependency. You concatenate the previous hidden state with the current input, uh, pass it through an activation function, or in LSTM you can do more complicated operation here, and then do the output, and also have the uh, contribute this to the next timestamp 
hidden state. So the problem here is there's dependency across the uh, tokens, limiting the scalability. Another way is using convolution, which we are familiar with. We have a window, and we can run convolution to have a fixed window size. But here, the limitation is that although you can have multiple layers, you still have limited context for the receptive field. Right? So that has limited context information and resulting to inverse the modeling capability. Since you can only see a a little window of the text. So different from computer vision, where you have very good locality in natural language, uh, what I'm saying right now might relate it to a long time ago, what I said a long time ago. So uh, such locality does not necessarily appear in natural language. So convolution may not always be a good primitive. Uh, like we mentioned, there are two tasks. One is the uh, discriminate task, the other is the generative task. So using RN or LCM, uh, we can use bidirectional RN for discriminate task. Since bidirectional means you can see not only the current word, but also the future, the word in the future. Right? So it is not done offline, um, therefore you can have bidirectional. And for generative task, when generating the new word, you can only see the previous word but you cannot see the future word. Therefore, you can only have one direction um, of the hidden state, right? So here, the hidden state only depends on the current input and also the previous, previous hidden state. Well, here, one hidden state not only depends on the previous hidden state, but also the next hidden state. And here, the problem of RN and LSTM is that if you have a long sentence in the middle, the word here, okay, if you want to get the, uh, the information of chef, which was actually quite a, lot, quite a while ago, the info, information of chef has, has gone through many uh, layers, which is proportional to the sequence length. So potentially, it takes um, an order of magnitude of the sequence length uh, to model the interaction between two tokens. So image has such kind of locality, but language may not have the locality. And another limitation of RN or CM is the limited training parallelism. It has a dependency. Dependency kills the parallelization opportunity. It takes n steps to get to a state n, making it hard um, to parallelize. And the numbers, numbers here means the number of steps before a state can be computed. It's propagating in the diagonal way. Zero steps, one step, two steps, three steps. To solve those limitations, they build a transformer. Okay? So this is a basic architecture of transformer published in 2017. And we are going to cover um, different components, starting with tokenizer, and how to map into tokens into embeddings, and the transformer block, into, including the multi head attention, fully connected layer, layer norm, residual connection, positional encoding, and also um, the uh, final prediction with a linear head. And we'll start with the uh, tokenizer. So, how do we convert a word into a token that the computers can understand, which is the very first step in a transformer? So actually, what's the relationship between the word and the token? So this is a result of a tokenizer. Each color is a different token. You can see large generative models. Generative actually has been chopped into two tokens. Gener is one token. Relative is another token. Right? So the number of words uh, is actually less than the number of tokens. They're roughly in a similar scale, like 1 to 5, 1 to 6. Uh, one word can be chopped into several tokens, and a single word or comma can be um, a, a token as well. So you can roughly think a word is a token, but a, word, a token might be a smaller um, portion of a word. And then we want to map the token into embeddings. The naive way is to use one-hot encoding, right? Use like one zero 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 
to represent the 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 0, represent food, and 0, 0, 0, 001, 0, 0, 002 represent movie. So you can represent each word as a vector that has many values, the number of value equal to the number of words. And each word has only one entry that is one. What's the problem using one hot encoding? Right, exactly. If you have a vocabulary size pretty big, the vectors can get super long. They contain all zeros except a one value. Um, this is very uh, redundant. So the natural way is to use a vector to represent, to embed each word. Okay? So to map the word index into a continuous word embedding. In this case, we have three dimensions in the word embedding. Uh, in the reality, we may have hundreds or even thousands of uh, dimensions for the word embedding. So here, the good movie, each one of them is mapped into a vector. There are several uh, ways to map word into vector, like word to vec, globe, those are some of the early pioneer work. And nowadays, we can also train the word embedding end to end with a language model. So in the future, just think of each word as a vector. Each word is a vector. Okay, now comes the fun part, the multi-head attention. Okay, so we are going to cover the building blocks of the transformer block, including multi-head attention, FFN, layer norm, and also residuals. So what is a multi-head attention? So now we have a word, we have a word embedding, which is a vector, maybe 4K dimension. And we, here we project that 4K uh, word embedding into query key and value, three separate vectors. Okay? So here we have um, the, hidden, uh, the word embedding we projected by three matrices, QKV, uh, turning the number of tokens by the hidden dimension into number of tokens by hidden dimension, but three separate uh, vectors, uh, QKV. So this query key value design is analogous to what? Like a retrieval system. You can take a YouTube search as an example. You have many movies. You want to type a prompt in the search bar. Okay? The query is like the text prompt to input into the search bar of YouTube. And the key would be the titles or descriptions of, of a movie. And you try to see which uh, title or description is closest to your query. And then the value would be the corresponding videos. Could be a pretty large uh, video file. And the key could be um, representing uh, this value. Okay, so you multiply the query with the key to get the similarity and have a weighted, weighted average for the values. So what we do here is multiply the query and the key to get the inner product make sure we want to normalize it by square root of d so that for different hidden dimensions, it can be normalized. So this is QK transpose divided by d. So after that, we want to uh, pass it through a softmax function to get the attention weights. And what is the dimension for that? Since we have nd times uh, dn, uh, the resulting uh, attention matrix is n by n. We can think of, it, think of it as the weight to have the weighted, uh, weighted sum of these values, okay? Uh, weighted sum of the values. And the weight is calculated by QK transpose. Here we pass it through softmax. Why do we need softmax? Yes, we wanted the attention to sum up to one when we are doing the weighted uh, average for the um, weighted sum for the values, okay? So we pass it through softmax, make it sum to one. This is interesting. We're going to cover the attention sink phenomenon in the next, uh, next lecture to see the problem that softmax brings. Okay, so the attention computation is, is pretty heavy. It's O n square, which means you have n number of tokens. It can be quite long. Like in an academic paper, the number of tokens could be like 6, 6K, pretty long. Um, you can multiply the attention weights 
with the value, multiply the similarity here with the value here to get the output, which is the final step, multiply the probability matrix with uh, the V matrix to get the final output. So this is the self-attention. I saw many companies interview question is how, how write the self-attention later in, in PyTorch in 10 minutes. So pretty important. So let's see, uh, what is the attention map? Mm, this is a machine translation, machine translation task. Uh, this is French, this is English, this is the attention map. We can see usually um, we have the diagonal pattern since uh, usually the word maps sequence to sequence. Uh, but here we have some reverse relationship. These three words versus those three words, English versus French, they have different habits. One is um, begin to end, one is end to end. They have the reverse sequence. So the attention mechanism finds the corris correspondence between the words. Correspondence between the words. If one head is not enough, oh, question here. Mm. Yeah, so I think there uh, two reasons. One reason is make it easy to parallelize. Rather than depend, everything depend on the previous token, we want to be able to independently calculate the feature for, uh, for each token. Um, so that since here the QKV projection doesn't depend on the previous matrix, um, so we can do them in parallel. And the second reason, uh, like we put the example over there, uh, the query key value, those are uh, widely used in the retrieval system. So people may borrow some idea from there. Okay, so uh, we want to increase the number of attention maps. So rather than like a single attention map, can we have multiple attention maps to capture a more detailed semantics? Okay, so here we introduce multiple head. So each head will produce one attention map. And here we can have eight, eight heads to produce eight different attention maps. Here's a visualization of different heads. Um, you can, it's hard, hard, hard to explain uh, why they have like this kind of pattern for each head, but it's learned end to end to capture the relationship between one language and another language. When implementation wise, um, we just can cat multiple has together at the output and pass it through a projection matrix, okay? pass it through the projection matrix WO. And here we are chopping the input dimension like 4K into, um, for example, you can have multiple has, each has can have a smaller portion of the, um, of the has. I can have 32 has, each had has uh, 128 uh, dimension. So the total dimension is still 4K but you can have multiple uh, sub dimension in each head. And you do the trans uh, transformation in independently so that you can produce multiple um, attention maps rather than just one attention map. Like in this case, we have eight attention maps to capture um, detail, more details in the relationships. And then we introduce this attention masking mechanism. Remember, we have two tasks. One is discriminate task, the other is generative task. In the generative task, the token can only see the previous token. It cannot see the earlier token, the later, the future token, right? So here we want to uh, have this mask to make sure that um, uh, one token can only attend to the token before it, okay? So here token number four only attend to token zero to four, doesn't attend to future tokens rather than like if we don't apply any attention mask, uh, each token can see both the previous token and also the future token. Like here, attention four cannot only see, uh, the token four cannot only see token zero to four, 
but also all the way you can see through all the tokens. So this can be helpful for distributed tasks. So this is the um, IMHA multi-head attention. The next component is the feed-forward network. Although it's just two FC layers, but there are so many uh, uh, intricate uh, relationships here. So um, why do we need a fully connected layer here? So what does the self-attention learn? It learns the relationship between the tokens. Okay? But also we want to also um, learn those element-wise, um, token-wise, element-wise nonlinearities and apply those nonlinearities to each, um, each hidden dimension. Therefore, we added this feed-forward network to help with the uh, feature modeling for each hidden dimension. The vanilla implementation is actually quite simple. Just two-layer, multi-layer perception. Uh, we introduced a layer earlier uh, with a much larger uh, hidden state size. So we call it inverted uh, bottleneck. And you have four, uh, we have three here. This is the number of hidden dimension that can range from uh, 712K. Um, like in a popular 7 billion parameter model, we have 4K dimension. Uh, in the in the hidden state, which is the hidden dimension here. In a, a 175 billion parameter model, like uh, GPT-3, we have 12, 12K here. And then we projected by the first FFN uh, to 4D, um, and then pass it through an activation function, um, and then have another FFN to project it back uh, to D dimension. So basically, uh, very simple two-layer, multi-layer perception. But we are going to see uh, with several design variants um, using different architecture later. Okay, so the next component is the layer norm and also the residual connection highlighted here. We have covered multi-head attention, we have covered feed forward, now it's the added norm. What we have learned so far, we have learned batch normalization. And you see this um, across the batch dimension, like we have n images, and this is the uh, sequence length. Sequence length in CNN is basically the H and W, um, the size of the number of pixels. And you have the feature dimension, which is actually the channel dimension. So different channel, you average, uh, you calculate the mean um, for, 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 for the entire x, y, and then you get a one, um, um, one value, which is the bias, and also the scaling factor for each channel. Okay, you have n channels, you have n such numbers. But in uh, uh, language models, we want to do layer normalization. Okay, what they say is nothing to do with the batch dimension, just a single batch okay, across the feature dimension. What is the feature dimension? Like here, like 7 billion parameter model, the feature dimension is 4K. Okay, across uh, this 4K dimension, we want to normalize it. You have different tokens. We want to make sure for each token, um, the, the center is zero, the mean is zero, and the variance is one. Okay? For each token, we want to make each token to be, uh, you have many tokens. Okay? For each token across the feature dimension, we want it to be centered around zero, and the variance of one. So we use the position here to normalize the, uh, to do layer normalization, and followed by a learnable high fine transformation of a learnable alpha, uh, a gamma and beta here, um, followed by the layer normalization. The gamma and beta here is actually quite helpful. We can, this is very cheap, it's linear, right? So um, this on rather than on square, therefore we can play a lot of tricks on the gamma and beta. For example, you can do fine tuning by tuning only the gamma and beta, especially helpful for uh, combining LoRa with long contacts. And also we can merge a lot of the quantization scaling factors into gamma and beta. Like we were going to learn in the smooth quant, the AWQ in the next lecture, uh, we are going to merge uh, those scaling factors into gamma and beta in the layer norm layer. Okay, so um, the initial transformer 
خب خواهی کرد That's a long term to, to prevent it divided by zero yeah. Prevent divided by zero The initial transformer is using this kind of post normalization which is saying you have the MHA multi height attention first and then layer norm FFN first and then layer norm but recent, recently people find this pre-norm is actually having better accuracy because the layer norm first, then MHA, which makes sense because you want to normalize uh, each token, make them uh, uh, have a mean of zero, uh, variance of one, and then calculate the attention matrix. The layer norm first and then FFN. So if you see the term uh, pre -norm, post norm versus uh, pre now pre-norm, now you understand what that means. Do the normalization first, uh, later, or do the normaliz normalization first. And doing the normalization first, pre-norm, is more popular due to better training stability. All right, now we talk about um, an interesting part, which is positional encoding. So far, we co covered this multi-head attention, but does the, the sequence, does the position, in the attention mechanism matter so far it doesn't matter we treat it as a set the location we don't have any location information yet no matter where you are they are symmetric but that's that doesn't uh, quite fit our demand right we rather than uh, the, the set encoding we want to have a sequence encoding to have the uh, position information like a word close to each other versus a word a two words far away from each other, the meaning is different. So we want to um, solve this problem where attention at FFM do not differentiate the order of the input tokens, which is unlike convolutions. So the solution here is to add the positional encoding into the uh, hidden dimension or word embedding. Uh, how do we do that? So this is a, the first one, positional encoding. Um, using a unique encoding for each word's position in a sentence. Okay, so here we have two dimensions. One is the uh, token index. In this example, we have uh, 50 tokens in a sentence. Okay, here is the feature dimension, okay, like 4K in, in Lama 7, 7D, but here, we have 128, 128 um, feature uh, dimension. And we want to distinguish token. This is token 0, token 10, token 20, token 50. We want to apply a different position encoding to different tokens. And also, even for each token across different features, we want to apply a different, uh, unique uh, positional encoding. And here we use uh, this function, okay? So sine WKT versus cosine WKT uh, to encode the positional encoding, which is added to the raw word embedding, like what we discussed before, the raw word embedding, we can add it with uh, this positional information. Now let's do some ablation study here. Um, what if the, the T um, or the K gets larger? Why here it's moving pretty fast, but here it's moving very slowly across this dimension. Almost doesn't change across uh, this token dimension. And see if K is pretty large, um, the Denominator is pretty pretty large, okay, and then the W becomes smaller. The frequency gets small smaller, so that's why here you can see the frequency gets pretty small. Well, here the frequency is pretty high. It's changing. It's changing a lot. So in this way, we can di differentiate these two dimensions. Are they periodic? So if you have a very very long sequence, it can handle in infinite input. And you can use different frequency to differentiate uh, to have all, uh, to prevent it from like two pi. Uh, every after two pi, you get a um, the same value, right? 
but using two dimensions, you can differentiate that. The research about not just adding them, but having an average. Right now, you're saying average. Yes, now they are treated equally, right? You have a word embedding, you have a position embedding, add them up together. And then we can see some advanced techniques um, to replace this idea. So this is the original paper using this simple idea, and we're going to talk about design variants in the second section of this lecture. All right, now we put them together. I did use this um, uh, transformer, and this is the result showing that compared with this uh, non-transformer result, the blue score, the accuracy for machine translation is pretty high, while the training cost is uh, two or three orders of magnitude lower than uh, conventional methods. The transformer surpasses all previously published models and ensembles at a fraction of the training cost. All right, so let's take a short break before we jump into the design environment. Back, let's continue our discussion about transformer design variants. So most of the initial transformer paper has, uh, has been very widely used by the community, uh, while some of the design has changed. So people proposed uh, various alternative designs, um, including um, encoder-decoder model and the variants, including the encoder-only model like BERT or decoder-only model like GPT. And also, um, rather than just absolute positional um, encoding, people find uh, encoding the relative position matters. So we're going to talk about those relative positional encoding. And also the KV cache optimization, especially when the sequence uh, gets pretty long, uh, you have to store a lot of values in the KV cache. We're going to talk about what is the KV cache and then how do we optimize the KV cache to make it smaller, including multi-head attention, MHA, multi-query attention, MQA, and also group query attention, GQA. This is like group convolution, depth-wise convolution versus normal convolution. Uh, finally, um, rather than the conventional FFN, we're going to introduce this gated linear unit. So let's start this journey, starting from encoder-decoder, encoder-only, decoder-only models. So the encoder-decoder model has two, two parts, the encoder and also a decoder. This is the T5 model. And actually the original uh, transformer using uh, used for machine translation is also a encoder-decoder architecture. Like in translation, um, translating uh, translated English to German, this is good. This is the contents in the encoder. The result in German is the uh, decoder's value. Uh, similarly, we can do this acceptability task, like cola sentence. Um, the course is jumping well. So this is not acceptable. This is grammarly is correct, but semantically is not correct. So the answer should be not accessible, acceptable. And this is checking the semantic similarity. The encoder here, uh, sentence one, the rhino uh, graze. Uh, on the grass, sentence two is the uh, rhino is grazing on the field. They're pretty similar, so ranging from zero to five. This has a score of 3.8 in the decoder, showing that um, it's quite similar. Or summarization, this is the, in, the deco in the encoder, uh, state authorities dispatched emergency crews Tuesday to survey the damage after an onslaught of severe weather in the Mississippi. And the summarized version is in the decoder, like six people hospitalized after a storm in the county. The encoder-decoder um, method is actually uh, feeding the prompt into the encoder. So this is the prompt. Um, and uh, the decoder basically generates you the answer. Like if you do the translation, this is the source language, okay, you feed it into the encoder block. So here we have three layers. This is the token dimension. And then this is the result. We feed it into the decoder okay, and generate uh, one by one uh, the target language uh, token by token. 
The prompt is fed to the encoder, and the decoder generates the answer. That's the encoder-decoder model. Another popular way is using the encoder-only model. Um, the most popular one is BERT, bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. Okay, so it's an encoder-only language model. Um, it's trained using one of the two objectives. One is the mask language model. The other is next sentence prediction. So what is a mask language model? So we are going to mask like 15% or some percentage of the input tokens at a random and train the model to predict those mask uh, words. Like here, the movie is very masked. And we want to predict this is boring. Okay? So we mask it away using a special token called mask token. And we feed um, these tokens into the transformer, including uh, position embedding. Okay? Together with the token embedding, they are added up together, including this special token, this mask token. Okay? Um, and it passes through this uh, transformer encoder and get the uh, prediction. Okay, and we supervise it by uh, uh, injecting a classification loss right here. So what is the attention mask here? Since this is the encoder, uh, each token can see both the previous one and the, and the later one. Okay, so the attention mask should be the full attention. Each word can see all the words, not only the previous word, but also the future words. So the attention mask on the top right corner is a full uh, uh, matrix. The second task, which is less often used these days, is the next sentence prediction. So given two sentences, whether sentence B is the next sentence of sentence A, a bit deprecated these days. So using this way, we can pre-train a language model to predict those masked words, and we can use this pre-trained model to fine-tune it to different downstream tasks. The next category is the decoder-only model. So compared with encoder-only, decoder-only model, you can see the attention mask um, has only, uh, each word can only attend to the previous words. That's why the attention mask is only the half of the previous one. A typical model is the GPT model, standing for generative pre-trained transformer. Okay, so what is it generating? It's given the previous words and generate the next word. So that's why it's called generative. And it's a decoder-only language model. Okay, so here we are given this sentence, a robot must obey um, the orders given it. And then we want to predict uh, the next word. So here we input the current word, which is 8. It attend to all the previous tokens, but not the future tokens, only the previous tokens. And we can see it happily attend to a robot. It actually attend to a robot, which makes sense. It just refer to the robot. Okay, and we pass it through uh, several layers of mass attention and feed forward network, and then predict the what is the next token. And also, we can um, use two ways. We can either fine tune the pre-trained model to downstream task, or we can uh, having larger model to have um, zero shot or few shot um, manner, which it doesn't require fine tuning if the model is large enough. We are going to cover the several examples later. Okay, so basically, uh, just next word prediction. The next item we are going to cover is the absolute positional encoding versus relative positional encoding. Some of you already hinted this why do we need absolute encoding to add it to the word embedding? Do we have alternatives? The answer is yes. So compared with absolute positional encoding, okay, which will fuse those positional information into the input embeddings, including both Q, K, and V. And the information is then propagated uh, through the entire transformer. The relative positional encoding actually providing the relative distance and injected into the attention score, into the n by n attention map by either 
adding a bias to the attention map or modifying only the query and the key. So the key, the V is not modified. The V is not modified. So it's different from the first case. So the advantage is that we can generalize to sequence length that have not seen during training. We train short and test long. Usually we have this long sequence requirement and like summarize a whole paper which can have like 6K tokens. What if the model is trained on only 4K tokens? It hasn't seen uh, if the positional encoding, if it's absolute, it's from 1K, 1 to 4K, it's absolute. How do we extend it to 6K or 8K? So uh, relative positional encoding has the advantage here to train short, test long, but it's not working naive. If you do it naively, it requires some, uh, some tricks to make it actually work. We are going to cover those tricks. So that is the advantage of relative uh, encoding. You can train short and test long and generalize to a longer sequence than what you have seen in the training time. So it's, uh, it encodes the relative position, which makes sense. If, if a sentence, the two relationship between the sentence, um, no matter which uh, location in the text um, the sentence is, the meaning might be similar. So, so let's see uh, two examples of relative positional uh, encoding. One is this alibi encoding, the other is this rope embedding. Let's see first this alibi encoding. So the idea is to change positional encoding only related to the relative distance, but not the absolute index. Right? So here is the attention map. We have Q1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and K, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, so this is the original attention map, original attention map. And this is the relative uh, positional uh, encoding. If Q and K have the same index, the relative index is zero because they have the same index. But this one is Q2 and K1 differ by one. Okay, so that's why um, this diagonal part is all one, including here, like this is one, two, three, Q3 and K1 uh, and K2, right? This is Q3 and K2 differ by one. So everything in the diagonal part is the same. Like here, this is Q, Q5 and K1. And therefore, this is Q4. Okay? So only the relative distance matters. The absolute position doesn't matter. That's why no matter what is the absolute dis uh, location, as long as the relative location is different by two, this value is two. And we manually set a select scaling factor and to add these up together. So what's the difference with absolute encoding? Previously, we are adding the word embedding with the positional encoding, the raw word embedding for QKV. Now what we are adding, we are adding the attention map with the positional encoding. So this is just adding this offset to the attention matrix defined in the relative distance instead of adding it to the input token embeddings in QKV. Another approach is to use this rotary positional um, embedding. This actually is the key part of the LAMA tool. We are going to see that in the homework, very popular these days. It's a very popular implementation for the positional uh, embedding like used in LAMA. And what it does is actually rotating the embeddings in the 2D space. Okay, so we split. So this is the uh, word embedding. And we split the embedding of D into D divided by two. So we group every two elements together. Okay? So uh, each pair, like a pair here, is considered as a 2D coordinate. Why do we need a 2D coordinate? So that we can rotate it in the 2D space. And we apply our rotation according to the position M. First token, second token, third token, sixth token. Enhance the transformer with rotary position embedding. We have six tokens here. We divide the hidden dimension of each token 
uh, group them by two, every two elements are together forming a, um, a 2D coordinate x1, x2, x1, x2. Um, and we use uh, this m, which is position, to multiply by a constant theta, okay? to rotate by m theta, m theta. So the larger the m, the more you are going to rotate. And how do we define the theta here? It's actually uh, 10,000 to so the power of minus 2 i minus 1 divided by d. And why do we need like 10,000 here? We need a big number to distinguish more tokens. Since if you do the rotation, you rotate by 2 pi, you go back to the original, of original um, value. You cannot distinguish them anymore. So every time we have to move like a little bit so that we can accommodate more uh, longer tokens rather than like pass through 2 pi. Okay? That's why here we need a pretty big number. It cannot be infinitely big, otherwise we are too, too small, we cannot distinguish them. Uh, basically, when you are doing a dot product of two, uh, two vectors, um, what is happening there? Uh, so if you do, the, um, this is doing the transformation, you rotate, you rotate it by m epsilon, and when you are doing the dot product of two vectors, uh, both, you pass it through this uh, rope uh, transformation, you can see we are multiplying the, uh, the norm and also subtracting the angle. Okay? Since the phase angle of the inner product of two complex vectors okay, is basically the phase difference between these comp complex vectors, m minus n. So this is the relative difference. No matter how big m or n is, the difference matters, not the absolute value. Okay? So that's why here this is the relative transitional encoding. So this is only applying to the Q and K, not to V. Therefore, it's impacting the um, attention matrix. Since the dot product, rather than directly dot product between Q and K, okay, now we do the transformation for Q, do the transformation for K, and then do the dot product. And the value would be related to the relative distance of Q and K. And V is now changed. That may answer your question. You're not adding this number to the dot product. You're doing the attention vector transformation there. But... Yes, exactly. Exactly. We are not, this is a bit more complicated than just simply adding it, but we are changing the equation to calculate the dot product. Rather than dot product between Q and K, we are doing the dot product between the transform the Q and transform the K. So I, I really like the color here, so we can see the result. Um, this is every uh, two values, they have the same color, but it's also mingled with this red color. Red means its location. And here is mingled with uh, the, this green color. This green is this location. And what is the implementation here? So, like we mentioned, rather than directly doing Q K dot product, we do the transform the Q and transform the K. What is the transformation? This is the transformation matrix. Okay. Uh, we have the first one. Uh, we can see every two elements are grouped together. So every two elements is group together, share the same uh, rotation angle. Okay, since two elements x and y, you can rotate in the 2D space. And here, uh, d divided by two, since originally you have d dimensions, now since you're grouping every two of them together, that's why we have d divided by two. All right, so that's the transformation. And let's see, how do we extend it to longer context, which is one of the key motivation. We want to train short and test long, right? Train short, test long. Say previously we have seen only 2K tokens, right? During training time, we have seen only 2K tokens. But we want to attempt uh, uh, to generalize that to 4K tokens. Uh, what is the naive approach? 
you just extend it from 2K to 4K and, and use the same beta, but M is from 0 to, to 4K. Actually, that doesn't work. You cannot directly fix the C beta um, and just increase um, the number of um, sequence length here. Right? So what does beta mean? Beta means the rotation angle. Since you have a longer, longer context, you cannot rotate the same angle. But if you double the number of sequence, you should reduce only, rotate only half. Okay? So the correct solution here is actually beta equal to beta divided by two. Okay? So uh, you are actually squeezing um, to the same, um, uh, same region rather than rotate by two circles, you know, still ro rotate the same amount. I squeeze more points, 4K points, into the same range. So that's the way to train short, uh, train short and test long. All right, so uh, that's positional encoding. Now let's talk about another important concept, which is KV cache optimizations. Uh, again, it's related to um, long contacts when you are keep uh, keep chatting with a chatbot, or you want to summarize a very long document. Mm, we are going to introduce multi head attention, similar to normal convolution, multi query attention, similar to depth wise convolution, and grouped query attention, uh, an analogy to the uh, grouped convolution. So, what is the KV cache? Um, so, we are talking about the GPT style. Uh, which is very popular these days, the uh, decoding only. Okay? We want to uh, store the keys and the values of all the previous tokens, because each new token is going to see all the previous uh, tokens. And rather than recomputing it every time for each new token, uh, since they are the same, we can store um, those key values for the previous tokens when we have a new token. Since they are the same, we don't have to recompute each time. We call it KV cache. So this is example. Uh, so far we have uh, three tokens. I love Guinean. Okay. So we are currently at time uh, T2. And this, uh, this X2 is going to attend to all the previous tokens. There's two tokens. Okay. So it's going to attend to, um, this is the query, this is the key, uh, this is the value. Um, this is the queue query of the new token. Q2 and it's going to um, multiply with a k0 to calculate the similarity. Remember the YouTube example, this is the search bar, this is the video's description, right? We want to see the similarity before we uh, do a weighted average, weighted sum of the v of the value. Okay? So the um, Q2 and k0 is 0 0.3, Q2 and k1 is 0 0.1, and Q2 and k k2 is 0 0.6. So we need to calculate um, we need to store um, the key for all previous tokens and also similar for the V. Okay, they stay the same no matter if it is uh, Q, uh, Q2 or Q3. And you can imagine as a sentence, input sequence gets longer and longer, the amount of value we have to store will grow linearly. Okay? Ultimately, it will grow really long. Let's see another example. What happens if there's no KV cache? This is the video. So in this video, there are four steps. Okay, we have the QK, QK transpose, and uh, uh, multiply with V, and finally, uh, that's, the, that's the attention. So without KV cache, for every new token, for example, here we have to calculate this two by two uh, matrix, and here we're four by four. We have to recalculate everything. But actually, the beginning portion is actually shared across uh, Q, uh, across token one, two, three, and four. So actually, we are wasting time calculating the previous regions, and we use that QK transpose normalized version to multiply with V. So what if we have the KV cache? If we have the KV cache, same four tokens, um, the previous calculated uh, 
uh, K and V can be cached rather than recomputed. So the purple part for the K and the purple, purple part for the V remains the same across different tokens. Um, therefore, you don't have to recompute the QKT for each token. Like previously, you already calculated Q1, K1. Now you don't have to calculate it when you are at Q4 or Q3. Similar here, uh, you already calculated Q2 or K2. Now you don't have to calculate it in the future step. But the overhead is that you have to store this purple part in the memory, and that grows linearly as the sequence length gets longer. And how long can it be? So we give you some real-world examples. How do we calculate the size of the KB cache? The intuition is that it will grow linearly with the sequence length. That's indeed the case. What is the other uh, factors? First of all, the mini batch size. One user, two user, three users, certainly that grows. A number of layers. Each layer has its different K and V, so each layer has its KV cache. And each head, remember we have multi head attention, so each head will have its KV cache. And the KV cache is proportional to the hidden dimension, right? Hidden dimension, if it's large, each word requires a 128 um, size vector, so that's the um, uh, embedding size. KV cache size is proportional to the embedding size. And also it's proportional um, to like K and V, right? You have K, you have V, that's why you have two parts, you have two multiplied by two. And here is the sequence length. You want to summarize a long document versus a short document. So the KV cache size uh, is proportional to the document size and also two, uh, two bytes for IP16 representation. So for uh, every token, every batch, you need half a megabyte for Lama 7D. Similarly, we can calculate Lama 2 or 13D. Okay? For 13D, the number of layers increased from 32 to 40. And the number of heads increased from 32 to 40. The hidden dimension in each head remains the same for different Lama models, 128. Length KV and two bytes per uh, two bytes, so this 800 kilobytes per token per batch. What if we use 7D Lama 2 7D using MHA multi height attention? KV cache you have double the layer from 40 to 80. Number of heads also increased to 64. Here is two and a half megabyte per token per batch. And let's see what that means. Two megabyte per batch per token. If batch size is one, number of sequences is 512, you need um, one and quarter gigabyte to store the KV cache. What if you want to summarize a paper? I could give you a clear paper. You want to summarize it, you want to review it, give you some questions. It's roughly uh, four to six K tokens. And four K token require 10 gigabytes of memory. The GPU has 80 gigabytes of memory. What if we serve 16 people, like everyone in our classroom, we submit a job to GPT-4, uh, submit a paper, wanted to summarize it for us. 16 people, one paper, 4K tokens, that require 160 gigabytes of memory. And that require two A100 GPUs just to hold those KV, the KV cache. Not even the activations, not even the weights, just the KV cache. What if everyone in MIT want to do that service? Can you imagine that gets pretty big. Two A100 GPUs, each one is 20K US dollars. And that's 40K, just serve everyone here in our classroom. That can get quite expensive. So we need, urgently need to reduce the size of the KV cache. This is even assuming this is Lama 2 7D. 53 is 175D. So it's even larger. 54 is even larger. So what do we do with it? Um, oh, by the way, this is the showing the linear growth of the KV cache. Okay, so here um, is the batch, so, uh, batch size of 1, uh, 16, 32, and this is KV cache size. Um, this is the model size. 
Okay, so um, it can even surpass the model size. This is a calculation, batch size, number of layers, and number of has, hidden dimension, number of tokens, and KV. So people propose several techniques to reduce the size of KV cache by reducing the number of KV has. Um, so multi-head attention is very important to capture the relationship between um, the query and key, right? Between the query and the key. Uh, we still maintain the same number of has for the query when we have different queries. But we want to reduce the number of keys, reduce the number of the number of values. Just like the YouTube example, we want to reduce the number of movies. Okay. Um, so there are two cases. Um, this is the original case. Um, the other two cases are multi-query attention and grouped query attention. So multi-query attention is saying we can average all the values and keys into one um, value and also one key. So um, in this way, we can reduce um, the number of KV, KV has to only one in this case. So we have, uh, you reduce from N has for KV to only one has for KV. For the attention, you still have um, N attention maps since query is still maintained by N number of queries, N has of queries. But certainly that's like depth-wise convolution sacrifices the model capacity. So another way is to do grouped query attention, which is in the middle between multi-query versus multi-head attention. So grouped query attention is saying several, um, you group several um, key and value together and reducing the number of uh, number of has. So here we have eight has, now we group every two together and we have only two has in this example. So in typically, we reduce it by eight times, eight times is a typical number. Uh, for example, Lama 7b, we have um, 32 has, so now we can have 32 divided by eight, we can have only uh, four has. So this is showing the reduction. So previously, um, this is the size of the KV cache using MHA, multi-head attention, and this is using the um, group query attention. The size is reduced by eight. Okay, since the number of had h here reduced from 64 to 8 in this example. This is using the um, multi-query multi attention in the purple here. It's 64 times smaller because previously we have 64 has, now everything is merged into only one had. So the uh, reduction of the KV, KV cache is pretty significant. But what about the accuracy? So this is showing the performance um, of the multi-query attention, group query attention, compared with the baseline, which is the multi-head attention. So we can see on the Lama 2, 30B with 150B tokens, um, the GQA, the group query attention, um, actually matches the accuracy of multi-head attention under the large model sizes, like 30, 30B model. But a multi-query attention, the accuracy, you can see some degradation about, about the accuracy, which makes sense because in this case, if you are losing the most information, well, if you select the right amount of group number, like here, using eight, you can maintain the accuracy for using, even using group query attention. And as a result, this is also used in the largest LAMA2 model, the LAMA2 7B model. All right, the last one is from FFN to gated linear unit. So previously, when we are talking about FFN, we assume this inverted bottleneck e to 40 value or value activation function. Um, but improving over this FFN, people proposed this Gated linear units, GLU, okay, which actually contains three matrix modifications. Uh, this is the first one, second one, and the third one. Okay, and here we are using the addend to wise 
multiplication as a gate. Okay? So first, d to uh, 8 divided by 3, d is also inverted, but the size is smaller than 4, since we want to maintain the total computing the same. And then we pass it through a swish activation function. So we're going to see that in the next slide. Pass it through this swish activation function, and then um, have the element-wise multiplication, and finally project it back from uh, back to D. And this is showing the perplexity uh, using different architectures. For example, using uh, GLU gated linear unit versus not using that, um, using the sweet GLU switch activation function with gated linear unit is performing pretty well. Um, and here using the GE GLU is also performing quite well. But recently this um, switch activation function plus a gated linear unit is getting very popular. So people chose that one, which gave a very good accuracy. So the lower the better for the perplexity on the right hand side. And this is showing the activation function uh, for G, uh, for Gallo and also for Swish. The only difference is the um, parameter here. And overall size or overall shape of the activation function is pretty similar. All right, so that concludes the second part. Now we are going to dive into popular large language models by combining the techniques we have learned so far. Actually, uh, recent years, the number of parameters in large language model is growing super fast. And because when we have larger number of parameters, the emergent abilities uh, uh, appears. Only these emergent abilities only emerge uh, with, with model that is large enough. Like in this task, modified arithmetic. Uh, in this task, 1 plus 1 becomes 3, 2 plus 2 becomes 5, basically like adding 1 the final result. So 100 times 200 uh, plus 200 becomes 301. It's modified arithmetic. We want to, mm -hmm. uh, like the large, large language model, to do the such task. And we find only when the uh, training flops is larger than like 10 to the power 22, then it can have uh, good accuracy on this task. When the model is smaller than that, the computer is smaller than that, cannot solve such problem. Uh, this is another interesting problem. Uh, for word unscrambling, like the word HTE is a scramb scrambled version of the English word the. Like if you rotate the sequence, this is the word the. Or if you want to uh, scramble this S O P uh, H P T O, it's actually photos. We want to have large language model to do such task, but it's only task possible when the training flops is greater than like 10 to the power of 22. So LLM exhibit such emergent abilities that are only available with large enough model size. And GPT-3 uh, is getting up transformers to be few short learners, which is introducing a new concept called in-context learning. Okay? So what is in-context learning? Traditionally, for downstream tasks, people have to fine tune the pre-trained uh, pre model for different downstream tasks. You have 10 downstream tasks, you have to fine tune 10 times. Like if you want a, like a pre-trained model um, to do um, machine translation, uh, you have to give an example, train it, get a gradient, update the model, give another gradient, uh, give another example, get a gradient, etc. to fine tune the model. And finally, you can um, uh, handle the new task. So this is traditional method. So zero shot is basically saying that um, we directly describe the task in our prompt. We don't train a model for different tasks. We use the same model across different tasks. And how do we specify the task? We put it in the, in the prompt. Translate English into French, give this English word. Okay, so this is a zero shot. Predicts the answer only given a natural language description of the task. No gradient ever happened. No fine tuning actually happened, which is very good. We can actually add a few more examples to improve the quality. Okay? So in addition to the task description, we also see a few examples of the task. Like here we have three 
translation examples together with this task description, translate English to French. And then we feed it to a new prompt that's going to give you a good answer. So this is showing that these larger models, like 175 billion parameter model compared with this 13B or 1.3 billion parameter model, these larger models can more effectively uh, utilize these few short demonstrations. As you can see, the accuracy is much higher for the 175 billion parameter model. And on the right hand side is showing that uh, with um, one shot, zero shot, one shot versus few shot, the more example you gave, the higher the accuracy. And when the model is large enough and the number of um, examples in the context is large enough, even without prompt, no task description, compared with task description, the accuracy is pretty much the same. Saying that you even don't have to tell the model, translate English to French, hide this part, just give three examples. When the new, task, uh, new word came, you can automatically predict the answer. And when you have large enough model, large enough um, examples, you can match the accuracy of um, with language is uh, with task description versus without task description. So these are the evolve evolvement of these GPT models 2018 to 2023. And after uh, eight, five years increased by several orders of at least the three orders of magnitude. This is just so amazing. Uh, this is year I started my job at MIT and this so amazing to see um, such big advancement versus the GPU memory actually uh, haven't quite catched up. So there's a huge demand to bridge the gap between the fast increasing demand versus the supply. OPT model, which appeared last year, okay, when I was teaching last year, this model just appeared. Different sizes from 125 uh, million to 7 billion, 60 billion, 175 billion parameter. Uh, it's open source, pre-trained language model from Meta. Um, it's, it's a decoder only model, pre-norm, use pre-norm only except for one of them. And using the ReLU activation function in the FFN. For the 175 billion parameter model, the hidden size is 12K. 96 has vocabulary size is 50K. And context length is 2K. It's a bit short, cannot handle a paper very well, which usually require like 4K or 6K. And uh, the performance is relatively comparable to the GPT model for zero shot applications and also the few shot applications. There's also a blue model, okay, which is using the uh, pre norm and also the GALU activation function. To describe the GALU activation function, Using the alibi positional embedding, remember the alibi positional embedding, just adding this relative position into the attention map. Zero, minus one, minus two, minus one. Okay. I can support multilingual, uh, 59 languages in the corpus. Llama, okay, this appeared this year, which is uh, getting uh, a lot of contribution to the open source community. It begins to use this SWE uh, GLU, okay, switch activation function, gated linear units rather than two FFN layer, three matrix modifications. Uh, there is a switch activation function and together with an element wise uh, HANAMA pro dot product using the uh, rotary positional embedding, the rope uh, positional embedding, which is covered in the lecture. And it's getting pretty good accuracy compared with uh, different models. Much better performance compared with previous open source models. And the most popular one is probably the 7 billion parameter model, hidden dimension of 4K, 32 has, each head has 128 uh, hidden dimensions, 32 has. And then Lama 2 is even better. Okay? It's trained on even larger amount of tokens, okay? from one trillion to two trillion tokens. And no sign of saturation yet. If you train longer, actually the performance for this 7B, 13B, 34B, 7B, 70B can probably even have even increased. And it's using the GQA group query attention, uh, which I've introduced 
for larger models like uh, Lama 2 or 70B, which uh, has 70, 64 has, but only 8 KB has rather than 64 KB has. Also, introduce the introduce, uh, instruction tune the model so that uh, if you supervise that with, um, to, uh, with the feedback so that you can handle uh, conversation better. And here is showing comparing the uh, performance. This is GPT-4 and this is the Lama 2. And this is the Falcon model. Okay. Um, so it has pretty big hidden size, KV cache number of layers is pretty similar. Uh, comparable performance as Palm too large. My really interesting one is recently this Mistral 7B model. It's a pretty small model, but it's claimed to outperform Lama 213B and also Lama Lama 34B. Very well trained. Uh, hidden dimension is also 4K, 32 has. A uh, KV CAD is uh, is eight using uh, uh, GQA group query attention. So the interesting part is not only the GQA but also introduced this sliding window attention, okay? sliding window attention rather than the full uh, vanilla attention. Uh, it's using the sliding window attention. It's no longer O n square. Sliding window size by n. That's the complexity. Um, in one layer, the effective window size is pretty uh, is pretty limited. But if you stack multiple layers together, the receptive field is going to finally you can see all the tokens to the back. Like here, you can only see window size amount of tokens before you. But across many different tokens, uh, different layers, you can finally see a much long, larger, longer effective context length. So the, the dream of scaling up never stops. So Chinchita law is saying that as we scale up the number of parameters, the amount of uh, training tokens we have also proportionally scale that, right? So we not only increase the number of parameters, but also you have to increase the amount of training data. So data engineering, data collection, data curation, very important job. Lama 2 breaked this, this rule with using a much larger number of tokens. So 7 billion parameter model, according to Chinchita law, require like 200 billion tokens. But Lama 2 increased by 10 times, use the 2 trillion tokens to train it and give you a very good performance. And we are going to use that um, in the homework 4, lab 4, which is released today. We'll come to check it out. We are going to do quantization on it and also deploy it on our laptop. All right, we're over time. This is so exciting.